Hello, my name is Dave Pasquale. I'm the owner of Pasquale Aviation, and today we're going to talk about cylinder inspections. I put this presentation together for the American Bonanza Society. Um, I did an ABS tent topic at Oshkosh 2018, and uh, this was the PowerPoint that I used. Now, I've added a few slides to it uh, since then uh, in order to make this video. Uh, the reason I was led to do this presentation was I started doing aircraft maintenance management uh, on the side and one of the things I found is um, that many shops around the country are not able to uh, take adequate cylinder inspection photos and I think part of that is that they don't understand uh, what they're looking for and so I was trying to, to get you know trying to help those people out with a video that might show um, some of what is needed and you know give some examples of photos and things like that um, so anyway uh, we'll move on and uh, here this slide shows the Vividia Ablescope VA400 uh, this is a scope that I've used to take all of the photographs and videos um, in this in this presentation um, you can see it's available at Amazon for just under $200. Uh, it's the best scope that I know of on the market, especially for that amount of money. Uh, it's gone through several revisions since it first came out. I had an early version. I bought it when it was first released. And uh, the early version didn't have a sealed tip. Uh, and, you know, mine, like I'm sure many others, didn't last very long because of that. Um, it gets dirt on the lens and you know oil as well, and it was extremely difficult to clean um, and almost impossible after a while. Um, fortunately, they replaced that under warranty, and they came out with the latest version, which has a sealed tip. Um, it also has a um, what they call a snap button and a light dimmer. Uh, the snap button is basically a shutter button. Um, that's in the cord and the dimmer uh, does just what you would expect and dims the lights um, You know, this is a huge improvement over the the first scope that I have uh, The only downside to the new scope is the they sealed the end of the tip with a single piece of glass and so um, You know the lights that that you're using to illuminate the subject are coming through the same piece of glass as the image is, is being taken and that's not always a you know a perfect situation if you get some dust particles on the lens it can create circular um, ghosts if you will in the uh, in the image because the light coming through the lens illuminates the dust particles uh, if you see that, you know, you need to clean the tip of the of the scope and fortunately with it being sealed It's relatively easy to clean um, Ablescope recommends using alcohol uh, To do that alcohol and maybe a clean swab and it, it should take care of it um, The snap button and the dimmer are less useful to me. I use the Ablescope with the laptop computer um, you are able to use it with an Android device such as a, a phone or a tablet I prefer the laptop because it gives me a larger screen and because it also supports the screen itself um, and it also makes uh, you know my workflow of dealing with the images afterward easier to deal with um, so I also use with my laptop computer it's a uh, it's a Windows device it's running Windows 10 and I use the the app that is included with Windows 10 uh, you know like I said the upside to that is it makes for an easy workflow the downside is it does not support the functionality of the snap button and the dimmer so uh, because of that I make sure the dimmer is all the way up if you if you have the lights turned down the app will compensate by increasing the ISO or gain if you will um, to bring the image back up to the same brightness so you'll end up with essentially the same image from a brightness standpoint um, but it'll have a whole lot more noise in it if the if the lights are dim so I just keep it all the way up and it seems to work fine and the snap button doesn't work at all with the Windows app 
Um, so you're stuck using the button on the screen, which isn't as convenient, but um, you know I, I can manage with it. The preparation for a cylinder inspection, obviously you need the cowl removed, spark plugs removed. I generally work through the upper spark plugs, but depending on the installation of the engine, it may be better to work through the lower spark plugs. Cylinder temperature below 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the maximum temperature uh, that the able scope is able to operate at. Uh, preferably, you'd want it at room temperature uh, because as it gets near 140 degrees, the image will become more noisy due to the heat buildup in the sensor. Um, so, you know, you want to try to keep it as low as possible. Uh, that's not always easy to do if you're you know, trying to do a quick turnaround with an oil change and a cylinder inspection, um, which I do a fair number of individual cylinder inspections at an oil change. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind. It just needs to be below 140 degrees Fahrenheit or it can damage the sensor or, you know, and the camera. Um, I start with cylinder one at bottom center. I, I work through the cylinders in the order of cylinder 1, 3, 5, and 2, 4, and 6, much like you do with a compression test. Um, you know, so cylinder 1 at bottom center is where I start. I take all the pictures in the same order every time. This makes it easier to sort the images afterward. As you record images uh, with the, the borescope, the computer puts them in the... Um, in the camera roll and so from there I'm going to take and, and copy the images out of the camera roll and put them into the customer's file uh, for, and then have them dated so that I have a file folder with the date of the cylinder inspection and then there's subfolders in that that contain the, the images for each cylinder. If you put them in order when you look at at the camera roll you'll be able to tell uh, you know by looking at the piston photos that that's the first photo in the series for each cylinder so you have the piston photo as the first and the cylinder wall as the last and as you look at the the block of photos in the camera roll you'll be able to grab you know cylinder one three five and two four and six based on on that you know picking out the piston photos so the way i take the photos is i do piston Exhaust valve face, intake valve face, exhaust valve seat, exhaust valve guide, intake valve seat, intake valve guide, and cylinder wall. Uh, the rest of the presentation will, will basically follow that same order. So the first photo is the piston. I have three images here of a piston. Uh, these are taken with the, with the piston at bottom center, and the scope is just inside the spark plug hole. Um, and uh, you know with that you can't quite get the whole piston in the field of view unfortunately that's just what we have to live with um, but it works out fine I generally don't see a lot of issues on the piston itself um, you know if you've had a, a detonation or pre-ignition event which would be indicated by other things you could see melting along the perimeter of the uh, the piston I suppose if you had foreign object get into there if some kind of part screw or you know some other foreign object got in there you'll see nicks and dings all over the top of the piston uh, in this case the picture on the left shows a slightly oily film on the piston the center is normal and then the right says valve impact we'll talk about that in a minute um, but the left picture here if we focus on that the oily film on there I see that in quite a few cylinders uh, I don't get too concerned about it unless we have high oil consumption. Uh, if you have high oil consumption and you're trying to narrow it down and you don't have a, um, you know, you don't have an external leak somewhere, then, you know, and there's like no indication on the belly or something like that, then maybe you start looking at things like oil residue on the cylinder or inside the cylinder on a piston and, and kind of suspect that maybe that that is an indication of it burning oil. But if it's not using oil, there's no reason to, to really get worried about it. Um, the center photo is pretty normal. Normally the pistons are pretty dry. 
Um, some of them will have more buildup on them than others, depending on how they run the engine. If it's rich a peak, lean a peak, how much time is on the engine, will will change the the amount of the the deposits on the piston. Uh, on the right, you see there is a valve impact, is what it's labeled as. This was in a Continental IO360 installed in a Cirrus SR20 that was used at a flight school. Uh, the engine was exhibiting what's called morning sickness, uh, which basically when you go out and you start the engine for the first time of the day, it runs like crap, it's really rough, and you'll get, at least on one cylinder as the case was here, you'll get no EGT indication. Uh, what was happening with this one is the student would go out and start the airplane and it would run like crap. They'd shut it off. They'd come get the mechanic. The mechanic would go out. They'd start the airplane again and then it would run normally. Uh, the reason for that is there's a buildup of deposits in the exhaust valve guide that causes the valve to stick and it makes the engine run bad. And then when you shut it off, the cylinder heat soaks a little bit, the clearances open up, and then the valve starts to function as normal. Uh, this is a more common issue on Lycoming engines due to the way they cool their valves, and they have some service bulletins about checking the, the play between the exhaust valve guide and the valve stem. Uh, in the case of this Continental engine, I, I think it was mostly due to the, the airplane being used in a flight school, so it's running you know, full rich a lot of times, and it's also running at low power settings, doing, you know, takeoffs and landings and things like that, um, are all, you know, recipes to build up lead deposits in the engine. Um, when the exhaust valve hung open, it contacted the piston, and that's what left the mark. It also damaged the, the um, push rod for that valve, too, um, which we ended up pulling the cylinder from service and replacing it with an overhauled cylinder. Uh, but that's some things to look for on the piston. The next picture is the exhaust valve face. Um, these are all a normal condition on the exhaust valve. Uh, this is the most important picture that you're going to take during the inspection if you're looking at a Continental engine because that's where most of the issues occur uh, that lead to premature cylinder, um, I would, wouldn't say failure, but lead to the cylinder being pulled from service prematurely. Uh, the left one, left image here is a normal rich a peak exhaust valve. Um, as you can see, there's a, a buildup of deposits around the valve. And, and if you notice, they're in a, in a circular pattern. There's a bullseye. Here's the center of the bullseye. And as you progress out, there's different rings. And they're, they're pretty well uniform in width all the way around the valve. And uh, you know, that's that's pretty typical or pretty normal. Um, if you've seen the AOPA um, valve inspection poster, um, they refer to this as a burned pizza. And that's that's a, a good, healthy exhaust valve. The center photo here is a normal lean of peak exhaust valve. And you can see, you know, I'm sure if you've been around a while, you've heard the saying leaner is cleaner. Um, that the Lena Peak guys talk about, and this is an indication of that. Um, when you run the engine Lena Peak, the you know all the fuel and, and is basically burned up and consumed in the combustion event, um, so it leads to less deposits inside the cylinder. And here is evidence on an exhaust valve. Um, you still see the circular shape deposits on the exhaust valve. Um, and they're, they're even all the way around, and the bullseye is centered. Um, it looks very similar to this valve off on the right. This valve over here is a normal low-time exhaust valve. It probably has 30 hours on it. Um, and it just ha doesn't have enough time to build up, a, you know, a, a thicker deposit structure like you see on the, the normal Richapeak valve. Um, one thing I, I do want to point out on this valve, you see this this area along this side of the valve over here, you know, on the lower right side of the valve, there is is kind of white and shiny looking, and it doesn't continue all the way around the perimeter of the valve. Uh, that is a reflection in the deposits on the valve. The, the lights on the scope are causing a reflection on the valve. Uh, you want to be mindful of that when you're taking pictures of these valves. 
that it doesn't give you the false indication of an uneven heat signature. Uh, ideally, you'd want the scope to be perpendicular to the face of the valve. That's not always possible or always easy to do. Um, so as you move as you move the valve or move the scope around, you'll see this ring. That reflection will move around the perimeter of the valve. Um, you just want to keep in mind as you're looking at these things that that that's happening and don't let it throw you off. The next set of images here are an uneven heat signature on an exhaust valve. And you can see over here on the left, we have an early stage um, uneven heat signature. And you can see like the bullseye in the center here has shifted slightly toward the bottom of the valve. Uh, this outer ring has actually dissipated off. You can see right here, it, it curves down toward the edge of the valve and over here it's curved down toward the edge of the valve. Um, that's where the hot spot is. The hot spot's down here at the, the seven o'clock position of the valve. Uh, if that is left to progress, it starts to take on something like what you see in the middle here. And you can see this one here, the, the bullseye, the center of the bullseye has shifted further toward the, the edge of the valve. You can see right here is about the center. And then the outer rings have become compressed. The, the outermost ring actually dissipates off up here and over here. Um, and that's pretty, pretty much where you want to limit yourself if you're going to take action like lapping a valve or something like that. Uh, if you let it progress much further than that, there's a risk that there's permanent damage to the valve itself that would, would make the results of lapping a valve um, not not worthwhile. Uh, the trouble is there is no guidance available to tell you when uh, you're able to do that or how far you can go before you do that. So you're you know it's up to you and your mechanic or if you are the mechanic it's up to you to decide when and if that's an appropriate step to take or if it's just you know appropriate to replace the the cylinder or, or send the cylinder out for repair or overhaul. Um, on the right side here, you can see what's pretty much the classic burned exhaust valve. Uh, it matches what the AOPA had in their poster. You can see the, the deposits have taken on a bell-shaped curve. Um, that's pretty normal. And then in the center here, you can see this half circular area and that area often turns green. Um, and in the AOPA poster, they refer to green means stop. If you see green in the exhaust valve, they tell you to stop. Uh, this is a classic burn exhaust valve. Now, I want to give a little bit of a caution about relying solely on color in an exhaust valve. Um, color is affected greatly by white balance. It, it's what is referred to in digital photography as white balance. Uh, and, and basically what that describes is if you have a light source that is say like the natural sunlight or if you have a light source that's a fluorescent light or an LED or a um, you know an incandescent light bulb they're all going to have a different color temperature some of them are going to be more yellowish color lights and some of them are going to be more bluish color and some of them are going to be you know somewhere in between and, and what that does when you're taking a picture is it affects the color of the object you're looking at. So sometimes I've seen where exhaust valves look totally normal. They have a totally normal heat signature, except the perimeter of the valve will have, you know, what is normally a yellowish color, you know, coloration, kind of much like this one out here has this beige yellow color around the perimeter. Depending on how your, your camera deals with the white balance, it may look green. Uh, so, you know, you kind of want to, you want to use some discretion or use, you know, you know, use a little bit of common sense when you're, you're looking at this, one of these images, you know, to not solely rely on color. If, if everything looks normal, if you have normal, you know, even ring shapes on the exhaust valve that look totally normal, chances are the heat signature is normal too. Um, if you have something like this bell-shaped curve over here, or if you have, you know, like a, a weird, you know, lump in the deposits or something like that, that has green in the center, 
then yeah, I would be concerned and you want to take corrective action. Um, but you know, you just, you know, it's, it's not always an uncomplicated thing to figure this out, but you know, the alternative that you could always do if you're unsure is, is go ground run it for a little while and then check it again and see how it's changed. Sometimes that, that will affect the color too. Uh, you know, especially if you're talking about exhaust valves that are black versus orange or, or beige color, um, that's greatly affected by the mixture that the engine was running at right before it was shut down. The next series of images are the intake valve face. Uh, you can see we have a normal intake valve on the left that's pretty typical of what you see. You see some deposits on the intake valve, but they don't really give you a lot of indication of any anything like they do on the exhaust valve. Um, intake valves run cool because they got cool air and fuel coming into them, and they don't have hot exhaust gases going out. Um, the center image I have labeled oil on valve. The dark coloring around the outside of the valve is from oil wetting out the, the powdery deposits on the surface of the valve. That's more common to see if the engine has been sitting for a little bit um, after it's been run. You know, if it sits for a little while before you get to take your pictures, you'll see things like that because um, the oil tends to creep along the, the deposits. On the right side is an unknown stain down here in the lower right corner of the valve. Uh, I don't suspect anything from that. The valve is basically the same coloration all the way through. It doesn't look like, you know, there's a hot spot or something there um, like I've seen on the internet. And, and I would get, I would suspect that if you were to run this engine for a short amount of time and then look at it again, that deposit would, or that coloration, I should say, would go away. The next image here is the exhaust valve seat. Now, normally during a cylinder inspection, you would only see half of this image. The, um, the field of view of the able scope is not wide enough to catch the whole entire exhaust valve in one, one uh, picture like you see here. Uh, this image, I took two pictures and stitched them together in Photoshop so you could get a better idea of what's going on in the valve seat. Uh, this cylinder, had low compression, had 24 over 80, uh, and the, the area we're looking at is this dark area here. That's the valve seat, and you can see, hang on, you can see over here on this side, on the right side, that the uh, valve seat is dark in color and relatively smooth, and on this side, the valve seat has a lot of white deposit buildup, and you can see there's white and dark areas. Uh, I suspect that with this engine that was lead buildup, but it's it's very difficult to tell with the bore scope whether or not it's lead buildup or if it's pitting in the exhaust valve or in the, in the valve seat rather. Uh, they look very similar under the bore scope and there's not a whole lot of way to tell. Uh, the, I gave the owner the option of me putting the engine back together and running it for a short amount of time. Um, Continental says to put it back together and go fly it for an hour. Uh, the owner was not local to my area, so it was pretty inconvenient for him to be able to fly the airplane, and we didn't, he didn't want to pay for me to have somebody else fly the airplane. So uh, he opted to have me lap the valve in place, which is what I did. And it came up relatively quickly during the lapping process, which kind of indicates that it, it was most likely just lead buildup on the seat. So the next, the next picture here is the exhaust valve guide. The left uh, image is a normal valve, or valve guide and stem, I should say. The left image is a normal valve stem. Uh, that's typical of what you see on most of them. Uh, on the right, you see oil on the valve stem, and I see this fairly often, especially on higher time cylinders. Uh, the other time you would see it is if you let the engine sit for a while before you take the cylinder inspection if it sits for a day or a couple of days or even a couple of weeks like i said before the oil film will creep along the the powdery surface deposits on the uh, the stem there and and it will wet out the uh, 
the deposits given that dark coloration as you see right up above here. Uh, if you're not using oil and all other indications on the valve are normal, I would just continue operation with the valve and continue to monitor at regular intervals. This next one here is a video. Um, it's of an exhaust valve guide and stem that was taken during uh, the valve lapping process. I have the valve open much farther than it would be during normal operation right here. Uh, but the reason I included this was to illustrate uh, how much wear or how much play is typically seen between the valve guide and the valve stem. I hear a lot of talk on the internet and a lot of people attribute the uneven heat signatures to the exhaust valve guide um, wearing out prematurely. Uh, in this case here, this valve was showing an uneven heat signature and, and I lapped this valve in place on the engine. Uh, I'll talk more about that a little later on in the presentation. Uh, but what you'll see right here is, is how much movement there is. And you can see there, as I'm moving the valve stem around, there's quite a bit of movement between the stem and the guide. Uh, I see this on almost every exhaust valve that's been in service for any length of time. Um, you probably start seeing it at you know, 200 hours on, on average uh, time in service. And uh, you know it depends on the individual engine. Some you'll probably see it even sooner than that. Um, but you know, again, if, if there's no other indications, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily pull a cylinder from service because of that. Um, I have another video here. This one here is more typical of what you would see during the cylinder inspection. Um, it's going to be a valve opening and closing, and I want you to focus your attention over here at the edge of the valve on the right side, because uh, that's where where the uh, the valve, you're going to be able to see the valve shift in relation to the valve seat. So here I've started the video in motion and I'm going to move the cylinder. The valve is opening and then watch here as it comes closed when it hits the valve seat right there it shifts into place. I see that on on almost every single valve I look at in a Continental engine that has any amount of time on it and and all the, not all of those valves show an uneven heat signature. In fact, most of the valves I look at show normal even heat signatures, but they'll still sidestep like this one is doing during the, you know, during its closing. And obviously during engine operation, it's a much different environment. Um, it's under a lot of pressure from the combustion event and everything else that's pushing it closed. So, you know, during a cylinder inspection, it's a lot different than what the engine sees during service. So I, I wouldn't necessarily attribute a loose exhaust valve guide to stem fit to a valve that's going to have an uneven heat signature. Here is a, the same, a different valve. Um, this valve here was the one that I had the composite uh, photo showing the whole entire valve and seat. Um, again, this is the stem side of the valve. We're looking at in the bottom of the of the image right in, in here you can see the rocker arm coming up from the bottom it's contacting the valve stem in the center which is obscured by the rocker arm and you see that this circular shaped washer is the valve rotator that's what actually rotates the valve during engine operation and then the springs are underneath that and right here you want to focus your attention on the tip of the valve rotator um, as it presses the valve open, you'll be able to see the valve stem or just the edge of the valve stem. And, and what you'll see as it moves, uh, when the valve closes, you'll be able to see that sidestepping in, in the valve stem as the valve hits the seat. So here I'm going to animate the video. And you can see the valve is opening. And now it's coming closed. And watch very You'll see right there. See how the valve shot side shifts a little bit, and that's right when the valve hits the seat. Things going on there. If you notice the valve, the rocker arm. Uh, you know, so I I suspect that 
the geometry of the rocker arm itself is partly to blame for that side shifting. Um, and it may be due to, you know, it may be causing some wear in the guide itself. Uh, but again, I, I don't remove cylinders from service because the, the valves sidestep when they close. You know, it would only be if it has a, an uneven heat signature and then even then it, it depends on the individual owner and the situation of the engine whether or not I would, you know, lap the valve in place or, you know, just pull the jug and, and send it out for overhaul or replace it. So the next thing I want to talk about is the valve rotator. You can see here there are two images of valve rotators. The one on the left is the complete rotator and the one on the right is the same rotator that I cut apart. Um, this rotator, if you look right in here, this is the garter spring. You can see in the, in the open rotator, it's, it's a garter spring type rotator. And that garter spring is what actually causes the valve to shift. Uh, when the valve opens, this rotator gets compressed. The, the top part of the, of the rotator, which is visible in the left half of this image, is pushed into the, the bottom half, which is on the right. And the bottom half is supported by the springs. Uh, when that gets compressed, the coils of this, of this garter spring right here, they tip slightly and shift the, the relation of the top half of the valve rotator, which is attached to the stem, and the bottom half of the valve rotator, which is attached to the springs. Uh, and each time the valve is open, it shifts it slightly, and then when it closes, the, the spring coils stand up, and, and it gets ready for the next event. Uh, that's when everything works correctly. Uh, what I'm finding on these, when I, I'm seeing uneven heat signatures on, on engines or cylinders that have some time on them, I'm finding wear in the garter spring. And, and one of the things I want you to pay attention to is right in here, there's a land on the center of, of this boss right there. That land and then this area right here are stops in the valve rotator. They keep, you know, they limit the amount of compression that is applied to the garter spring. Uh, that's an important thing that I'm, that I've been finding out about. And, and so I want to advance to the next frame here, our close-up pictures of the rotator parts. And you can see on the left side here is the garter spring. And if you notice in the center is a wear pattern on this, the coils of the spring. And as you can see, the spring co coils are worn pretty significantly. And so that's the area where the spring contacts the Belleville washer, which is over here. You can see the contact area right there on the Belleville washer. Uh, what, when I measure this, the coil thickness of the spring is, is about 19 or 20 thousandths of an inch thick. And, and I'm getting almost half the thickness right in the center of this wear part. And so what that means is, is when this thing gets compressed, when this spring gets compressed, it's probably hitting the stops here and here before the, the spring really gets to be compressed enough to effectively rotate the valve. And, and along with that, having this polished area hitting hitting the Belleville washer, uh, that's not going to allow it to grip and rotate the valve, you know, as effectively. And I think this is leading to a fair number of burned valves in, in some of these cylinders. Um, now at Oshkosh, I went around and I spoke to a lot of different people, um, anybody who I could talk to that was knowledgeable, knowledgeable about engines and got their opinions on them. And, uh, also, I have spoken to the manufacturer of the rotator, and the manufacturer of the rotator told me that uh, they were working with Continental on a redesign of this, this valve rotator, and that redesign was suspended through them. Now, talking to Continental at Oshkosh, they alluded to that they may still be working on the redesign of this rotator, but it might be with someone else. So... You know, time will tell whether or not we get a new design rotator cap, but for the time being, this is what we have. Um, based on what I've seen um, from the ones that I've cut apart, I, uh, 
you know, I highly recommend if you're going to rotate or if you're going to lap a valve in place that you replace this rotator along with the valve spring, springs. The parts are pretty cheap, so it, it makes a lot of sense to just replace them. This next chart here is all of the same exhaust valve and all the times listed are indexed to the, uh, the, when the valve was lapped in place. Um, and if you're a reader of the American Bonanza Society magazine, uh, I did an article in January of 2018, it was published, about this exhaust valve. And so uh, I'll work through the, the chart here. You see over here on the left side, the top photo is 162 hours before the, um, the valve was lapped. And you can see the valve looks pretty normal. It's got a pretty even heat signature. Might be slightly off toward, you know, the, what would be the 8 o'clock position, uh, but not really significantly so. Uh, the next picture was 126 hours prior to lapping the valve, and you can see the, the center of the bullseye is shifted to the left a little bit more. The outer ring is a little bit thinner but still not, not very far off. Uh, now we move to the second column. The top photo is at zero hours. That's when I lapped the valve. That was at an annual inspection. And you can see here the, the valve deposits have taken on a horseshoe shape. Uh, they still almost come together out here at the edge of the valve. Uh, the, the center of the bullseye is shifted. Uh, that's an uneven heat signature, and the hot spot is over here on the left at the 9 o'clock position. Um, one of the things I probably should have noticed when I was doing this is the relation of the deposits to, to the cylinder head. You can see over here is the intake valve in the upper left corner of each image. And if you notice the hot spot on the picture here labeled at 126 hours is basically in the you know eight nine o'clock position and if you look up here at zero it's still in the eight nine o'clock position so that tells you right there the valve wasn't rotating um, but at the time i didn't really understand how the rotator works uh, all i did at that point was i lapped the valve and i put it back together so you see here the next photo down in the second column is at ten at ten and a half hours after lapping you can see a significant change to <clears throat> To the deposits on the exhaust valve uh, you know they're starting to work their way back to normal that's because the lapping process restored the contact area between the valve seat and the valve itself and that dissipates the heat more uniformly um, you see in the, the third column up at the top we have 33.7 hours and that's looking almost normal and then the, the bottom photo in the third column is at 91.9 hours. Um, that was at the point where uh, the article was written and published for American Bonanza Society magazine. And uh, one of the people that reached out to me uh, after the article was published was a guy by the name of Joe Fischetti. Um, he wrote a, an excellent article about doing cylinder inspections several years back for American Bonanza Society magazine. Um, and him and I exchanged uh, some ideas and he told me about these valve rotators, which led me to look into them. And that was what got me down the road of what you saw in the earlier frames of the valve rotator. Um, Joe, through his own, you know, inspection, you know, information or his inspection um, data was suspecting that rotators were playing a role in all of this. And so he asked, told me about it and asked me to look into it, which I did. And you can see, so as we progress further along in this chart, now we're at 119.72, and you can see now the, the heat signature is starting to move off toward the edge of the valve. And, and that led me to believe that, you know, what Joe was saying about the rotator and seeing this heat signature moving off, that maybe we only covered up the actual cause for the, the valve heat signature issue uh, by lapping it. But we didn't really correct it. If the valve rotator was bad, then we're only covering up by lapping the valve. So in this one down here, labeled 155.36, I replaced the rotator. And, and you can see now 
So we go from 155.36 with new rotator and springs up here to 161, which is only six hours later. The deposits haven't changed significantly, but what, what you can see is you see this circular deposit right here in the nine o'clock position right near the center of the bullseye has now moved over to the four o'clock position. So that's a very good indication that the valve is now rotating. Uh, but there wasn't enough time between the two to normalize the, the deposits. So now we move down to the last photo in the last column. It's 189.34 hours since the valve was lapped. And we have an essentially a normal looking exhaust valve. And that's the same exhaust valve that I used in the normal exhaust valve photos as labeled Rich a Peak. Um, and, and that's totally normal looking. And I should also say the rotator that was used that you saw in the earlier photos um, with the Warren Garter spring, that was a rotator out of this cylinder. Um, the cylinder had about 1300 hours total time since factory reman, um, which I guess it was a new cylinder, but it was factory reman engine. Um, it had 1300 hours on it when the cylinder was lapped and we're at about 1500 hours now uh, since the cylinder was new. This video here was taken during uh, the lapping process. And so what we're doing when we're lapping the valve is we put a uh, lapping compound, which is a gritty paste, in between the valve and the valve seat. And then we rotate the valve. And that gritty compound, you know, basically wears, it, it kind of acts like sandpaper almost, and removes a very small amount of material from both the valve and the valve seat. And, and what it does is it, it makes those two surfaces even out and mate, you know, basically perfectly. Uh, so what I've found when, I, when I'm lapping a valve, the lapping compound kind of changes the color of the seating area on the valve. And early on in the process, if you wipe the, the lapping compound off of the valve seating area, you can see a difference in coloration of the seating surface and that's what this video shows so i'm gonna i'm gonna uh you know animate the video here and i'm gonna, i want you to draw your attention to the seating area of the valve and the the silver areas versus the dark areas and and kind of work up here is where you're going to want to focus your attention so here we go we're going to animate the the video uh, the video is playing and you can see that that grayish area that's wider right there and then it gets narrower and it stays pretty uniform as I rotate the valve all the way around and then as it'll come around here you'll see it again right there it is see the wide gray area and then and then I'm rotating it back and forth that's the wide gray area right there and then now I'm going to push the scope into the cylinder and then rotate it around to look at the valve and there you go, you can see the horseshoe shape pattern right here. Or, you know, you can see the exhaust valve deposits right there. And up at the top of the image is the hot spot on the exhaust valve. And, and so that tells me that that area was not making good contact with the seat. And that's why you had the hot spot. Moving on in our cylinder inspection, um, we have two photos of the intake valve seat. I don't see a whole lot of issues wrong, you know, in this area. Um, you can see the photo on the left shows a normal uh, intake valve seat. Um, that's in a Continental engine, and uh, it's pretty dry. It's got a powdery lead buildup on it. That's normal. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of oil on the back of the valve, um, and and carbon buildup, um, and that's kind of what you see on the right side. The right side is out of a Lycoming engine. For whatever reason, I see more carbon buildup on the back of Lycoming intake valves than I do on Continental intake valves. Uh, but again, I, I wouldn't pull one from service based on that alone. Um, just because, you know, if, every, if all other indications are normal and you're not using excessive oil, uh, you know, there's not really any, anything that's going to, you know, lead you to want to pull that cylinder out in this picture. Now, obviously, if you're using a lot of oil, then maybe, 
you know, maybe that valve guide could be a, an area where you're pumping oil into the cylinder that's getting burned off, and then that might be a concern. Uh, but the, the picture on the right is of a higher time Lycoming engine, and that's pretty common for what I see in the higher time Lycoming engines. So we move on to the intake guide. The left one is a normal intake guide. That's a Continental engine. The one on the right is a Lycoming. Um, same thing applies here. You see the dry um, guide on the left and the, the wet oil on the right uh, on the guide. Uh, you know, again, like I said earlier, if it sits a long time before you take the inspection, you'll see more oil wetting out the the uh, deposits on the surface surfaces of the cylinder. Um, the one on the right, you know, is a Lycoming engine, a higher time Lycoming engine. It's not using an excessive amount of oil, so we're just going to continue to monitor and and you know see, you know, just monitor at regular intervals through borescope inspection and see if anything changes. The last of, of the cylinder inspection is the cylinder barrel. On the left, we have a low time cylinder barrel. Uh, on the right, we have a high time cylinder barrel. Um, both of these are steel. Uh, I should note that there are some out there that are chrome, and chrome has a different look to it. Um, the steel barrels have the cross hatching that you see, you know, all these scratches running diagonally around the cylinder. That's, that's a honing pattern. They do that to help the, the ring seat and break in. Um, that pattern wears away as the cylinder ages. Um, and what you end up with is what you see over here. You'll see essentially a smooth cylinder wall with occasional scratches, you know, going diagonally here and there. And then eventually they wear away all together, um, you know, if it's left in service long enough. Uh, but as long as you don't have excessive oil consumption or um, you know excessive oil consumption or metal in the in the oil you know metal in the oil or oil filter um, that's excessive you know and compression's good I would continue to operate the cylinder um, the next one here we have some cylinder barrel defects on the left we see piston scuffing that was on a fairly low time Lycoming IO390 um, the owner of the airplane was known to um, go to a higher power setting pretty uh, pretty much right away when he would start the engine instead of idling at, you know, uh, idle speed less than 1,000 RPM uh, till the cylinder built up some temperature. He was going up to, you know, 1,500 RPM. I'm sure, you know, like you, all of you have seen or heard of people at, at the airport that start their engines up and they just go and they rev up the engine and you know just taxi right out right away well that was what was going on here um, we attribute that to the piston you know which is made out of aluminum expanding at a quicker rate than the cylinder barrel and that causes a clearance issue and causes excessive wear that's at the 12 o'clock position in the cylinder uh, we weren't finding excessive metal in the cylinder or in the oil analysis and and compression was still good and the engine was operating normally otherwise so we're going to keep operating the engine and just monitor oil consumption and, and cylinder condition through borescope inspection and compression checks uh, the center photo shows a piston pin mark uh, it's it can be seen in any engine but it seems to be more common in lycoming engines um, also lycoming seem to have um, issues with the piston pins uh, you know contacting the wall and then creating metal uh, on, on a lot of the engines they're made out of aluminum and what happens then is if you see any corrosion in the cylinder like you do here the corrosion basically mills the the end of the plug off a little bit um, it's generally a self-correcting problem where the uh, the piston pin plug gets milled off a little bit and then it develops clearance or it shifts the other way for whatever reason and then doesn't wear on the cylinder anymore. The only time you would want to pull a, a cylinder from service is if you start having uh, lots of metal in the oil filter. Uh, then, then maybe you would pull it from service for that. Uh, I have sent samples out for analysis. Um, you know you know take the oil filter chips and send them to AvLab to have them analyze the chips to tell you what what the alloy is 
Um, and piston pin plugs almost always come back as, as aluminum and 4118 is the AMS number. Um, you know, if you see that, then you, you can pretty well bet that, that it's the piston pin plug. On the right, you see corrosion. I see corrosion in almost all uh, cylinders that have been in service for any length of time. It varies from just a, a small patch at the top of the cylinder, you know, a couple small spots to like this one here, almost the whole entire inside of the cylinder was covered with corrosion pitting. Um, again, it's all going to come down to if you're using oil, if you're making metal, or if you have low compression, uh, you know, any of those factors would, would lead you to take corrective action. If, if all those parameters are normal, then continue to watch and monitor. Uh, that was it for the cylinders. And now on some engines, uh, you, can, you can take your Able Scope and work down through the oil filler neck and get a view at the cam and lifters. And so what we have here is a Continental engine. This was on an IO550F17. This is a sand cast engine. It has a short oil filter or oil filler neck in the left half of the case. Um, all the sand cast engines, if it's an IO 470, IO 520, they all have that, that short oil filler neck and you're able to get down in there and see the first couple of lobes on the camshaft. On the left side here, the left image, you see a normal exhaust valve lifter and cam lobe. And that one there is cylinder um, six exhaust valve. And uh, it's the farthest most forward on on the uh, the camshaft. Uh, it looks pretty normal. You know, you're looking at this is the lifter over here, and then this is the cam lobe here. The center photo is of the cylinder five six intake valve, and you'll note that intake valves have have two um, two lifters per cam lobe. It's got a wider cam lobe, and there's two lifters running on it one for cylinder five and one for cylinder six in this case. Um, and you can see on the apex of the cam lobe, the apex is pointing straight at us. There's some circular or oval shaped patterns on the cam lobe. That's normal. Um, I see that on all of them and that's normal to see that. That's not an indication of where. Um, what you would be looking for here is pitting. Uh, or sometimes you'll see, you know, you'll see pitting forms a line running across the, you know, the apex or just prior to the apex. Um, if you see that, that'll, that generally leads to, you know, premature wear on the, um, on the lifter and the, the cam lobe. Um, anytime you have pitting on either one of those parts, if it's excessive enough, it will, will start to mill off the top of the cam lobe and uh, eventually lead to lower power and you're going to end up having to pull the engine from service and disassemble it in order to correct it. Um, it's a common issue on airplanes that sit for long periods of time without being run. Uh, cams are, are one of the areas that develop corrosion and you know is certainly a, a critical area if, if it's going to start milling the top of the cam lobe off. On the right side over here, you can see on the perimeter of the lifter is some pitting. There's some pitting up here near the top of the image, and there's some pitting over here toward the right side of the image on the lifter. Um, that lifter I, I removed from service. The cam lobe was normal. Um, the pitting wasn't as bad as it looks in the photo, um, but it was enough that if I had the lifter in my hand, say if I was, you know, Pull it, if I pulled the cylinder and had the lifter out in my hand and I was looking at it, I wouldn't put a new one, you know, I wouldn't put it back in without replacing it um, simply because of the risk involved with having pitting on a lifter um, that, you know, it'll do what I said before about milling the top of the, the cam lobe off. Uh, what we see here is a Lycoming uh, cylinder or a Lycoming uh, camshaft rather. Uh, on the Lycoming engines, on some of them, uh, this one here is an IO540, and uh, I'm looking through the oil filler neck, which is on the back of the, you know, toward the back of the case, on the top of the engine case 
It has a little plastic filler neck that's a couple inches long. I take that off in order to get better access into the engine. Um, and you can see, you know, several lobes near the back of the, of the camshaft. Um, on the left side here, we have an exhaust lifter. Uh, in the center is an intake cam lobe. And then on the right is an intake and cam lifter. Um, again, you know, you're looking for pitting in this area. This one here doesn't have any issues that I can see wrong with it. Um, it's a pretty normal looking uh, cam and, and lifters. You can see there's plenty of oil up there too. Um, so that, that one there is just just continue, continue to monitor condition and, and you know, carry on. Uh, the last thing to do with the cylinder inspection is to report the findings. Like I said at the beginning, I sort the photos in the fo folders by cylinder. Uh, I make a separate folder for cam and lifter if if I have it available, um, you know, if, I, if I'm able to take those photos. Um, you know, that would be the minimum that I would do. You know, if you're sharing photos with somebody, you know, either a mechanic or somebody like me who's doing maintenance management, uh, and you take a bunch of photos of a of an engine, you know, doing a cylinder inspection for you know pre-buy or or even an annual inspection, and you want to share those with the owner or share them with somebody else, you you need to have them split off into different into different cylinders. That way, there, you know, the person looking at them knows what cylinder they're looking at and and what parts they're looking at. Uh, I've gotten cylinder inspection results from shops where it's just a jumble of unordered pictures and so yeah you can tell that it's an exhaust valve or you can tell that it's a you know a piston or a cylinder wall or something like that but you don't know which one it is and that's not very helpful um, so you separate them all out and then you create a report um, I create reports for my clients um, and I have a, an example of what the what the part of what the report looks like um, you can see here I usually include two or, or three exhaust valve pictures um, I really only can fit two sets of photos on on a single page um, I just make this report up in in uh, you know Microsoft Word I'm sure there are better ways to do it those people out there who are more IT savvy or you know computer savvy than me could probably develop things that would be way more effective and more easy to use and allow you to view full resolution images that you know pop out from the screen and all kinds of other crazy stuff um, but for what I have available to me and what my knowledge is this is what I'm doing um, you know I basically have the current cylinder inspection photos on one side and then down here I have the last set of inspection photos and then because I had an empty space I include the last two of the exhaust valve face um, that allows you to kind of view a trend um, and then I also as part of my report I record findings um, I record the cylinder compression um, so it's basically what I see I had I had here a cylinder one was 61 over 80 I had a moderate leak past the rings and a mild leak past the exhaust valve um, and what I'm talking about there is uh, during a compression check, you want to, you know, take the, the oil filler cap off and listen inside the, you know, to the oil filter, filler cap to see how much air is getting into the crankcase. And then also listen at the exhaust, uh, at the tailpipe to see how much you can hear coming out the exhaust. Um, you know, my rating here of, of a moderate leak or a mild leak is purely subjective um, you know you kind of just gauge it based off of your experience or what you feel like it is um, you know it's just one more thing that you try to record along with all the other things that we're looking at um, to give you data and basically so if you had a cylinder that had low compression and you saw you know you had lots of air leaking past the exhaust valve but the exhaust valve had normal deposits then you might suspect the lead buildup on on the valve seat and then go run the engine some more but if you were listening to it and you heard you know you had the same conditions and you looked at the the exhaust valve with the borescope and you see an uneven heat signature even you know that bell curve shaped 
burned exhaust valve, well now you know there's a problem with the exhaust valve and they're using that information together to decide what to do with it. Um, that's, that's why I'm trying to record this information here. Um, and you can see I also write a little bit of a conclusion and, and my conclusion for this was, you know, condition normal has not changed since the last inspection, which is pretty much true of what I saw. Um, you know, so that all that stuff you try to do if you can, and that'll help you as you progress with the, you know, with that owner, with that airplane and engine. You know, if, if you do this regularly, then you can find you can develop a history of of those cylinders, and you can see trends developing, and and it's it basically leads you to be able to take corrective action you know, by lapping a valve or something like that before the cylinder gets so bad that you got to pull it from service. Or at least if you're not into lapping the valve in place, it'll allow you to pull the cylinder from service um, on a schedule and, you know, before it reaches the point of where it'll fail and cause an in-flight engine failure. So that's it for this presentation. I thank you for watching. I hope you find it informative. Uh, if you guys uh, need to get in touch with me or have questions, feel free to um, either comment below the, the video or you can send me an email. Um, my email address is airdave at ptd.net. Um, that's all one word, airdave, and ptd is Papa Tango Delta. I'll, I'll put that information down below uh, in the notes for the video. And uh, thank you for watching and, you know, hope you have a great day.